Welcome back. Let's talk about human structure. It's, it's useful to look at the structures of the human body from the small structures to the largest structures. Uh, because these structures work in concert. For example, atoms. Atoms have their own properties, sure, they do. Uh, an atom may be a gas, for example, a metal, a non-metal. They have a certain number of electrons and protons and neutrons. And there, let, let's, let's look at uh, emergent properties at each level. So atoms have the capacity of making bonds, for example. Atoms, however, uh, get together by bonding and making molecules. In this case, this, here, this is a water molecule. Um, molecules have different properties. Molecules may be um, acidic or basic. Um, they may be polar or nonpolar. Molecules can get together and form organelles. In this case, the organelle here is a mitochondria. The mitochondria has its own properties or functions. A mitochondria can make ATP. All the organelles in a cell uh, get together to make up that cell. And cells perform all the functions of life. Cells get together to form tissues, and tissues have very specific functions. Uh, tissues, in this case here, the tissue is a columnar epithelial tissue of the stomach, and it can absorb nutrients, for example. Organs themselves, the tissue uh, of this organ, the stomach, there's different tissues, including muscle, and that occurs to help digestion, both mechanically and chemically. Um, organ systems are a complement of many organs and structures that function in one specific capacity. In this case, the organ system uh, would be the digestive system. And the digestive system consists of ingestion, of um, breaking down food, absorption, and excretion. There is anatomical variation in humans. We're not all exactly alike. We spoke before a little bit about, um, about ribs. Do we all have exactly the same number of ribs? No. We do not necessarily, but the average, of course, is 12. But no two humans are exactly alike. Uh, some are missing organs. The palmaris longus, for example, um, the plantaris muscles. Those are uh, arm and leg muscles, respectively, that would have been useful, perhaps, in our evolutionary past. Uh, but as we don't use them anymore, some people just simply don't have them. We may have more or less organs than normal. Some people have two spleens. Uh, a single kidney, uh, perhaps six or four lumbar vertebrae. And there's variations in organ locations. So uh, situs and versus, for example, um, the, the organ is in the op on the opposite side of the body. What are the characteristics of life? What makes us a living form opposed to non-living forms such as rocks, for example. Uh, well, a characteristic of life is organization. Organization takes energy. A characteristic of life is cellular composition. All life consists of cells or is a cell. There are lots of singular cells out there. Um, that's why a virus is not considered a life form. It is not a cell. It cannot reproduce itself. 
all life forms, all cells contain DNA. Well, not all cells actually, red blood cells do not, they don't have a nucleus. However, um, they come from other cells that do have DNA. All cells excrete waste. All cells perform metabolism. Metabolism is all of the chemical reactions in a cell, or in the case of a human, in the body of the human. All life forms respond to the environment and can move at at least one stage of their life. All life exhibits homeostasis, in other words, keeping a stable environment. All life develops, grows, and differentiates into different um, um, functions. All life reproduces, makes copies of itself, that's because of the DNA, and all life evolves. Death of a human is considered when there has been no brain waves for 24 hours. Now, why are we different from each other? Well, our physical variation differs with, with uh, sex, male and females, age, diet, weight, degree of physical activity. That all changes our physiology. We may have a large heart due to our um, exercise. For example, the typical human values that are used for reference in order to compare um, people to is a reference man, 22, 154 pounds, light physical activity, 2,800 calories consumption a day. A reference woman, uh, same as a man except 128 pounds and 2,000 kilocalories a day. Homeostasis is the state of an internal environment uh, which is at what's called a dynamic equilibrium. It's not exactly the same all the time. It can fluctuate. It can fluctuate within a range around what's known as a set point. Loss of homeostatic control causes illness or death. For example, uh, what is our set point of temperature of the body? It's 37 degrees Celsius. If we go considerably above that or below, we get either a fever, which can be dangerous, or um, hypothermia. Here is the set point, 37 degrees Celsius. Our body maintains uh, an equilibrium fluctuating slightly around that temperature, but we respond in such a way that it will go back to equilibrium if it goes over, and it will go back to equilibrium if it goes under. So for example, if you're too hot, your vessels dilate to release more heat. If you're too cold, your blood vessels will constrict to prevent heat loss. If you get cold, you shiver. Shivering causes uh, muscle contractions which release heat because they are a chemical reaction. If you're too hot, you sweat, and that causes evaporative cooling. And yeah, your, your temperature is sensed by nerve cells, and the reaction is to shiver or sweat or to change your vasomotor activity. Now, I'm not going to stop now, even though that really completes that topic because I just want to uh, finish up the lecture. Anatomical terminology is a um, fundamental skill in anatomy and physiology and in medical practices. Um, most terms are formed from Greek or, Latin, Greek or Latin roots. And the reason for that is that there is an international language uh, of science and medicine. Uh, because during the Renaissance, there was so much confusion. People were discovering things at the same time and then naming them after themselves. So that caused a lot of confusion. That's known as eponyms. Eponyms are largely being dropped, like um, the Cowper's gland, uh, when the male reproductive system is now known as the bulbo-urethral gland, and that is a universal name. So um, there, are, there are books, and the Nomina Anatomica, for example, rejects all eponyms. Unique Latin names are given to 
anatomical structures. What I would encourage you to do is um, in the copy of, of your textbook, there's a lexicon of 400 common word elements in the back. Uh, you should become familiar with that. I'm not going to go over it now. It would take a long time, but keep in mind that there is generally a root. Uh, vowels join roots together. Become familiar with prefixes and suffixes and acronyms. So there's useful tables in the textbook. Um, single and plural forms, for example. I encourage you to, to look into um, anatomical terms. So the major themes that we've looked at so far, uh, form fits function, the history of biomedical science, the scientific method, human origins and adaptations, structure and function, homeostasis, stasis, and the language of medicine. Imaging is the field of medicine that is absolutely fascinating and has advanced our knowledge of the human body incredibly. So some imaging techniques are, for example, radiography or x-rays. Uh, they penetrate soft tissue and they darken a photographic film. So they detect dense tissue because the electrons do not penetrate the dense tissue. Um, occasionally, radiopaque substances are injected or swallowed, and those can be detected by an X-ray. Computed tomography or CT scan are X-rays as well, but they're low intensity, and they can give um, um, a very sharp image, a cross-section, for example. Magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, uh, that is very good for soft tissue, and it relies on the fact that atoms, uh, the, the nucleus of an atom tends to wobble. And so a radio wave can align the atoms. When the radio is turned off, the atoms flip back to their original state, and they give off some energy that can be detected. Another style of medical imaging is known as positron emission tomography, or PET scans. They can assess metabolic state which parts of the body are active at a given time. Um, a patient will be injected with radio uh, isotope of glucose. And since uh, glucose will decay over time, the nucleus, and we'll talk about that in chemistry, then um, energy is given off that can be analyzed by a computer. So these parts of the individual's brain, the red parts, are giving off radiation. And that shows that those parts of the brain are very active. Uh, sonography is a very gentle kind of medical imaging. It's, it uses sound. And the waves echo back and form uh, an image. It avoids harmful x-rays. It's largely used in obstetrics, but also um, in the detection of tumors. It's a very commonly used technique. And we will be going into, maybe into the lab. We might be doing some online stuff. But uh, I look forward to showing you some more um, imaging that we can do with our microscopes. OK, thank you for watching.